Hi, everybody, and welcome to Big Joe's Journal. My name is Joe Tilden, and I am the host of this program. Well, what a change in the weather. You know, we went from uh, high humidity, and today we're getting the after effects of that storm that uh, came ashore in Louisiana a few days ago. And uh, we've got a day of rain, uh, heavy at times, but, uh, you know, it beats ice and snow and it beats winter. And this rain will clear the air of whatever pollen there is. So we're going to have some wonderful Vermont fresh air to breathe. And uh, tomorrow, uh, sunny days return. But you know, it's great to look around the countryside and see everything so green and coming to life. And I noticed this morning now that uh, farmers are starting to sell corn by the, by the roadside. All a good sign that uh, we're right in the middle of summer, and that's the unfortunate thing, that we're in the middle of summer. You know, uh, winter seems to drag. I don't know about you, but from, from December, January, February, March, you, you wonder, you know, how much longer can this go on? April, you get a little bit of hope, but this year, of course, April was not. Uh, the, the way we really think about April is, you know, we talk about April showers bring May flowers, but the showers not only uh, ran through April and May, but well into June. And come July, we had summer. Well, hopefully, summer is going to extend a little bit into fall. And, uh, well, let's enjoy it while we've got it. You know, I watch the uh, weather folks on some of these other channels, and they're complaining about the heat. Uh, in some cases, of course, I, some people uh, complain a little bit in the Burlington area, some of the beaches on uh, Lake Champlain have to be closed because of uh, this uh, fungi that seems to crop up every now and then. And, and it's uh, rather, I don't know if it's poisonous to people or not, but it is to animals. At least two dogs have uh, gone swimming in the lake and gotten involved in this uh, fungi and, and uh, died from it. So to be on the safe side, the uh, Burlington Department of Recreation, uh, when these growths show up around the public beaches, they shut them down. And of course, when you close a beach on a hot, humid summer day, naturally people are going to complain. But, um, you know, you have to take precautions. It's better to err on the side of safety than to go ahead and take a chance that somebody's going to get sick or we're going to have a few deaths, and you'd have a lot of people screaming and crying and everything else. So let's enjoy it while we got it. We're more than halfway through July, and boy, it'd be great if we could hang on to what's left. But enjoy it, because winter will come soon enough, you know? If you complain about the heat, I ask them, I say, how many, how many times did your furnace come on yesterday? You know, think of it that way. Think of the money you're saving in fuel oil. And summer's a great chance to get out and to see the beauty of our state. Do a little traveling. A lot easier to travel this time of year than it is in the middle of winter when you got to uh, deal, you know, with roads that in some cases may be frozen over and may be slippery and may be uh, real dangerous to drive on. Well, today our roads are bare and they're clear. Some of them are still dangerous to drive on, but that's because of the, the people that are driving that, are, that shouldn't be, that are impaired in one way or another. But if you're going to get out and enjoy Vermont, you know, now's the time to do it. Well, I want to bring up the thing that's going to happen at the end of July, and that is the uh, Democratic Forum. They call it a debate, but it's not really a debate. And the July session is going to be held in Detroit. And it's going to be on CNN. And the dates are July 30, 31. The, of the 24 candidates that are in, 20 get on TV, and the other four are more or less forgotten. They might as well hang it up for all practical purposes. But the first round, it, the, the teams are put together by lot. And the first night, July 30th, 
the I'd say the two headline features are Bernie Sanders and Senator Elizabeth Warren. Uh, both of these candidates are looking for the same votes. They're both advocating much the same thing. And uh, they will be going head to head in that forum on the 30th. Now on the 31st, it's former Vice President Joe Biden and the junior senator from California, Kamala Harris, will be the headline people. And uh, my advice to her would be not to criticize the vice president too awfully much. Because I think a winning ticket for the Democrats, as I see it right now, would be Joe Biden for president and Senator Harris as his running mate. I think they'd make a great team. And I think they would win in a landslide. Joe Biden brings years of experience in government, which we need, and we need desperately in Washington. We don't have that now in the White House. This can poop that's there now is totally inexperienced in government. So we need Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Well, first of all, she's a woman. She's African-American and she speaks Spanish. Three categories that the Democrats need to win. And in Joe Biden, he should retake the labor movement for the Democratic Party. You know, Joe is a, well, he's a blue collar candidate. Comes from Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, lives in Delaware. He's a senator, was a senior senator from Delaware when Barack Obama picked him for his running mate, and Obama made a wonderful choice in Joe Biden for a running mate. Now Joe, running for the presidency, he's a, uh, well, Billy Sixpack type person. He knows how to relate with people. I mean, some folks have said, well, they don't like the idea that he some of his hands-on approaches to women. But you can criticize that all you want. But he does not have the record of abusing women that his potential opponent has. He's never abused women. He's always had great respect for women. And I think Joe, he's an outgoing person. Pats people on the back. Might pat him on the butt occasionally, shakes their hand. I mean, he's that, he's that type of outgoing individual. He's not the kind, you know, don't touch me because I'm superhuman. No, he's a man of the people. And he's what we need in the White House right now. He's a unifier. And the country needs a unifier to bring us back together. We're separated too much on many issues and many levels. And that brings me to my topic to today. And I want to read the First Amendment. After the uh, Constitution, the Ten Amendments were added in 1791. And they were ratified effective December 15, 1791, right toward the end of 1991. Something else happened that year in 1991. We went from 13 colonies, the 13 states rather, to 15 states. Vermont came in as number 14, and we were followed by Kentucky, which came in as number 15. Now the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, so there's a freedom of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government to redress for a redress of grievance. So all these things guaranteed under the First Amendment. This is a very, very sweeping amendment. The right to freedom of religion, the right to freedom of speech, the right to freedom of the press, the right to assemble for peaceable purposes. 
In other words, if you're going to assemble because you're going to overthrow the government, well, that really doesn't qualify here. But you have the right to assemble if you want to say a protest against the government. You don't like something that's going on. You have the right to assemble to do that. And for the redress of a grievance. Well, that's why you'd get together in assembly, say we don't like this particular thing. We would like, you know, take it to court, appeal it to the court and so forth. Well, that brings me to a local discussion <clears throat> that involves my, my good friend, Paul Clifford. Paul, for a number of years, was the uh, chairman of the Republican Party in Rutland City. At the same time, I was the chairman of the Democratic Party in Rutland City. When I say two opposite parties, you guys can't be buddies, but we were good friends. And Paul, for a while, ran a local bar downtown known as Ponies. And one feature that he had at Ponies was Sunday night, when he opened it up to teenagers to come in and and he served ice cream and soft drinks and stuff like that. And I know I was teaching drive red and a number of my students uh, took advantage of that. And uh, anyway, they, you know, they met folks from other schools and everything. And I think it was a very good thing. Paul spent a number of years on the board of aldermen and then he stepped down when he went into private business as a salesman for um, a company that sold pipes and stuff like that. Uh, he was appointed our public works commissioner when Chris Loris was first elected mayor. And then uh, Loris replaced him. And when he went back into private life, he, uh, he became a resident of Rutland Town and he ran for and was elected to the select board in Rutland Town. And I think he served a year, maybe two years, on the select board in Rutland Town. Um, he resigned because of an employment opportunity, moved back into the city of Rutland, and decided he still wanted to have a hand in local politics, re-elected the board of aldermen. Well, as you know, a couple of weeks ago, using uh, what we call social media, um, Paul had a thing that uh, went out uh, public and it showed a woman with uh, what two or three little kids and obviously people that were living in poverty and I think his message that he was trying to convey was the fact that poverty is not limited to certain races. Poverty affects everybody. He doesn't know a color line of any kind. You have African Americans that live in poverty, too many of them. You have Hispanics living in poverty. You also have Caucasians living in poverty. We see that all around us. Here in Vermont, where we're mostly white. You look at the number of people that are living in poverty. Um, folks that are laid off, for example, the jobs they had and all of a sudden their plant closes. And all of a sudden they have no income. They only go on unemployment for 26 weeks. But chances are very good that what they get in unemployment is not going to cover what they were earning when they were working full time. And we see closings going on in Vermont, I won't say every day, but I believe the last big closing was one in Waterbury, where they're moving to another state. And they say to the folks up there, well, you know, you can come and work where we relocate and find a job for you. Not easily done. Yesterday, while I was watching the Red Sox game, the uh, Starting pitcher for the Red Sox had come from the Baltimore Orioles. And he was pitching against his former team. And anyway, he, uh, he lost, lost again. Red Sox were knocked off five to nothing. But Jerry Remini was 
remarking on what happens when a player is traded during the season, the turmoil it causes his family. For him, he cleans out his locker, moves to the new team, makes new friends and all that. But for his family, and chances are these guys are young and if they're married, they have a young family. Family has got to pull up its roots where they are and move to the new community. Or they can stay where they are and wait out the season. But the man of the house is going to be gone. In the case of this guy, uh, the, the series that wound up yesterday is Boston's last trip to Baltimore this year. So he was able to spend two or three days with his family. But now he won't be able to spend time with them until the season is over. And chances are very good the Red Sox won't be going to the postseason this year. Not the way they're playing now. But it makes it rather difficult. Um, player has to gamble. You know, are you going to pull up roots? Find another place to live? Uh, they, chances are they aren't going to buy. They're going to have to rent because you never know how long you're going to be there. Major League Sports is a young man's game. And when you get into your, your 30s, you're a senior citizen. When you're 40s, people are amazed you're still standing up. And if they're going to buy a home or purchase something permanently, it's usually the uh, southern part of the country where things are a little bit warmer year-round. Well, the point there that I'm, I'm trying to get to in this First Amendment is that we may not like tweets that come out. Certainly the things that uh, the Ninkin Poop in the White House puts out every day seems that's about all he can do is tweet. I don't agree with him. But he's covered by the First Amendment the same as, as you and I are. So he has the right to express his opinion. Paul Clifford has the right to express his opinion. And he wasn't condemning anything. He was just showing that poverty knows no color barriers. And for that tweet that he put out, he's gotten a lot of criticism. The young lady that heads up the NCAA, former alderman Lisa Ryan. I can assure Lisa she has no problem, no fear going to the Board of Aldermen. Paul has a right to his opinion. He has a right to express it, just as I have a right to express my opinion. And I think people overreacted. Uh, Paul apologized. Personally, I didn't see any reason for him to apologize. <clears throat> I don't think he did anything wrong. I think the people that are, that are in the wrong and those that are jumping up and down and calling him a racist and everything else. Especially the editorial staff at the Herald. Nothing racist about it. It was never intended to be racist and never was. And you have to read it for what it is. You know, we have come a long, long way. And there have been a lot of errors in this country. And one of the worst curses that the United States had, we got from our mother country, and that was slavery. The absolute worst curse that this country has had. It took a civil war in the 13th Amendment to the Constitution to officially end slavery. But we know that there are still injustices Certainly for African Americans, it's still an uphill fight in this country. I mean, there's, there's still job discrimination. Bit by bit, we're coming around. The fact that Barack Obama was elected President of the United States not once, but twice, 
shows that the country has changed a lot. But the country has not changed enough. And that was proven by the election of this current president, who is obviously a racist. Certainly his last tweets about the four ladies in Congress, totally uncalled for. Totally despicable. But it shows the man for what he is. An individual that hasn't got the brains God gave a jackass. And that's very, very evident. Just about everything he does. There are still people in this country. Neo-Nazis. We see their foolish demonstrations. We have people right in our own state. There's a pickup truck running around the Rutland area with a Confederate flag in the back. We've got a long, long ways to go. But we're not going to accomplish anything by jumping on something and reading into it something that was never meant to be. And I think Paul Clifford was unjustly treated. And I'm not saying that because I regard him as a friend. But I'm saying it because what I know of Paul, he's a very, very fair individual. And he's no more racist than the man on the moon. When I was on the board of Alderman, I was interviewed when I was running for re-election by Brent Curtis, who was then uh, a correspondent with the Herald and, and covered City Hall and covered elections and all that. And we're talking about the drug problem in Rutland. I mentioned the fact, you know, when you see a lot of activity in one apartment, and I mentioned a few names, and I used a few Hispanic names and, and uh, Anglo-Saxon names and stuff like that. Well, I was accused of being a racist. The editor of the Herald at that time, who was now the head of the Rutland Free Library, did an editorial. This man should not be on the board of Alderman because he's a racist and all that. Well, Mr. Smathers uh, got relieved of his duties as editor of the Herald, not because he criticized me, but because he criticized the incumbent governor at that time, Peter Shumlin. And apparently there was enough pressure put on that uh, Mr. Smathers, Mr. Smathers was relieved of his duties, and he's now at the library. Well, I do not believe that I'm a racist. I hope I'm not, anyway. I try not to be. But you know, I grew up in an era which was entirely different from what we have now. And I was thinking back the other night, years ago, one of the big fundraisers for MSJ used to be the minstrel show. And that time, at St. Peter's School, the upstairs was an auditorium. Uh, today, that would have been shut down because there were no fire escapes or anything. And, as I say, the big thing was the, it was a minstrel show. And you had the choir, or chorus, or whatever you want to call it up there. And you had six end men. And uh, the master ceremonies, who was uh, called it inter interlocutors, I recall, but the end men all wore blackface and wigs and all that sort of thing. And nobody really thought anything of it. That it might be offensive to some people. I know one of my, my friends, we had a family that lived on Terrell Street, the Johnsons. And a gentleman who uh, I greatly respected name was Raz Johnson, and he's deceased now. Raz worked as a maintenance man down at uh, Woolworth, which is now part of the uh, Asa Bloomer building. But that time was one of the, uh, what we call them, five and ten cent stores. You had Woolworth, you had Fishman's, and uh, down where um, Green Mountain Power has their big show, uh, that was Kresge's. 
And then up on Center Street, you had J.C. Penney across from where the Paramount is now. He also played the saxophone. And he ushered at Christ the King Church. And uh, I remember talking with him one time about it, you know, and uh, he really opened my eyes on a lot of things. I know when I was in high school, I didn't uh, participate in the menstrual, but I didn't see anything wrong with it. I didn't see anything wrong with cakewalk at UVM at that time. But I do now. Now you see how people would be offended by it. One thing that, that surprises me still is at the Kentucky Derby. When the horses come out on the track and they play uh, Stephen Foster's song, My Old Kentucky Home. Um, there's the stanza in there, which would be truly offensive. But as I say, the country is changing, and I think we're changing for the better. We're not 100% there yet. If we were, Donald Trump wouldn't be sitting in the White House. And his buddies wouldn't be calling the shots. I think we're moving ahead. But a lot more has to be done. But we can't jump the gun and get all bent out of shape over somebody's tweet or somebody putting something on public view and all that. We have to remember common sense. And we get back to common sense, we get back to the First Amendment. Every American citizen has the right to free speech, whether we like it or not. We have the right to worship the way we want. We have freedom of the press. Some of the press is bad. Fox is so pro-Trump, it's sickening. But, you know, when this Constitution was drawn up, ironically, the original Constitution was written by a man who had slaves. And yet he was able to write, all men are created equal, and endowed by their creator with the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We've come a long way since then. We've had a civil war. We've had the 13th Amendment. In the 1960s, Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act and the Right to Vote Act, which many not to say many, but a large number of constituencies are trying to shoot down now, trying to limit that right to vote, trying to say you've got to come in with some kind of an ID card. You have the Trump administration trying to push. You get a clause in the, in the current census, are you a citizen? And all we have to do, the way people are being mistreated and how far we have to come, is look at the concentration camps on our southern border in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, and California. The way those people are being treated. You know, whether we like it or not, we're all children of God. We're all part of one huge family. It's called the human race. Some of us are Caucasian. Some of us are African American. Some of us are Native American. Some of us are Asiatic. But we all, whether we like it or not, we are all brothers and sisters in this great big family we call the human race under the common fatherhood of Almighty God. And it's time we stopped knocking each other, fighting each other, killing off each other. You know what we need now? We need peace. We need unity. We need to get along with people. We're not perfect. We never will be. It's because we're human beings. We, have all, we all have imperfections. But we also have an awful lot of good points, too. And I think it's time we... We look to the good points and not the bad. 
We look to uniting. We look to peace, not to war. So with that, I'm going to wrap up for this week. May Almighty God of his infinite wisdom continue to bless these United States of America. God love you. Have a great week, and we'll see you all next week.